Uh, my name is Bruce Barton. basic level as far as the technical aspect of it so bear with me for the people that understand um, some more of the technical lingo uh, the spectrum radio spectrum it's an expensive thing isn't it, anymore isn't it you know it's it's big bucks to get spectrum especially for the carrier uh, 700 megahertz the new 700 coming out it's a lot of money big time money. Most of what we're going to talk about will be VHF. When I say VHF, primarily we're talking about 133 to 174, and UHF being 400 band, uh, 433 to 470. Uh, pretty well everything we talk about can be drawn up and down the band. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference in characteristics that we'll talk about. We're not going to get into uh, amateur radio. I encourage everybody to please incorporate your, your amateur community as much as you can. It's a great resource. They've got a lot of things that they can do uh, with the amateur frequencies. It's, you know, it's a free resource. Give them a little bit of uh, extra support and equipment and it's amazing what they can do for you. So please explore that if you have not already done so. Communications range. And you'll hear me say this probably over and over again to the point of getting 
specific. Um, higher is better. Okay. The higher you can get your transmitter and your receiver, foggy you talk. It's just plain and simple. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So everything we talk about, we'll be looking at that concept for the most part. How do we get antennas higher? Uh, line of sight. If we take transmitter A, transmitter B, we put a mountain in between, what happens? Not a lot. Dirt and RF don't get along. Steel and RF don't get along. Frequencies, a lot of you are going to be mandated what frequency you can get by what's available um, or by what your agency has access to. A lot of what we'll talk about is, is what, as a search and rescue or public safety organization, you might be able to get to. So it's, please bear in mind if we're not touching right on your uh, type of availability. Uh, but that, you know, it's, that's pretty wide by what kind of organization or, or agency would be. Aircraft. Let me ask a question and get a feel for who's in here. How many people in here are associated with mobile commandments? Out of those hands that just went up, how many have an aircraft rating? Pretty close, maybe seven or eight digits. Okay. Um, you know, aircraft radios and marine radios, if, even if it's just as simple as a portable, you know, it's, oh. it's going to be something you're going to end up needing one day or another. Um, you have to think about, you know, of course, what you're going to get into. We deal, in our organization, we deal very little with marine, uh, except for our own boats. And we deal very little with aircraft because, unfortunately, we don't have a real good aircraft uh, resource in our part of Pennsylvania <coughs> other than medevacs, and medevacs are all capable of knowing to us frequency-wise. But we do maintain marine radio in our, in our vehicles, we have two or three of them, and we do maintain an aircraft portal in our command post. And we have used it on a couple of occasions. So it's something to think about. Um, Big problem with portables, of course, is it sits there for three years, and if you don't have a maintenance program on the battery, whether it's a clamshell AA pack or rechargeable, it's not going to be there when you need it. So a mobile or a fixed radio is, is usually definitely the way to go, especially in the General mobile radio service. not something probably most of you will use and it's available, it's out there. You've got groups like React to use it. So they're going to say frequency you may want to look at in your area is who is using GMRS, particularly your React organizations. A lot of the search and rescue teams have gone to it. Um, a lot of different public, uh, uh, public oriented organizations use it because it's very easy to get licensed on. There again, that's something you may want to, in your frequency plan, look at at least having the frequencies that you can plug in there if you need. Um, there is an incorrect statement in that slide. It is with license frequency, although it's fairly easy to get. How many people carry out of the command? Well, how many people have family radios available in their command units? Anybody? Boy, boy. Go out and spend seven, eight, ten bucks, especially if you're in remote areas, if you're dealing with parks and hiking area. Uh, they're real popular, and you do get a lot of incidents where you'll get lost hunters or hikers, and they'll come back and, hey, Joe's lost, but he had a radio, or the group went out, we can't find the, the group of three or four people, and they, they do have a family. Um, there again, it's, it's an inexpensive radio. Have one because if you get a situation like that, you can get up on that frequency. It may save you a lot of work. Um, they all operate in that standard UHF 460 range. And in theory, you can program. How many FCC people? 
and now you're not going to put your hand up anymore. Um, in theory, you can program that radio into a program any commercial UHF, although you are going to be in violation of certain FCC requirements, so I'll make that statement. Um, but you can plug the, put the receiver in in a commercial radio with your outside antenna so you have a much better reception to make sure you can transmit the capability off. But they will program it through regular UHF radio. And we have had a number of incidents over the years where we've come across those, uh, especially with hunters, hunters using the line. So there again, it's something to think about in your capability. It's not something you're going to use every day, but the one time that you get in there and you get that thing out and say, hey, Joe, you got there on channel 7? This family says that's usually what they use. And he asks you, how much money just this, did you just save? A lot for a fifteen dollar radio. Maybe. They are uh, they're great for a lot of the smaller nonprofit te uh, teams. We we'll use them. We use them uh, for inter team communications a lot within the grid teams, so they can talk and it keeps them off the uh, search frequency. And then there's there's a device out Garmin. God oh, bless Garmin. Um, how many people have seen the Rhino? Okay. Great device. It's got your GPS incorporated with the family radio. Uh, it's got the GMRS capability as part of it. They work really well. They're inexpensive. The basic ones are, you know, probably, you know, you can get them on eBay probably for 250 bucks, 200 bucks maybe for some of the older ones. And they have a very good 12 channel GPS built in. And the nice thing about it is it sends your ID and location when you key up. So anybody else with that on the same tone, same channel, can see you on their screen. All right. It's one of really probably one of the first real effective, inexpensive uh, AVL type systems out there. So you know, take a look at that. Inexpensive thing. Uh, our, the USAR teams, uh, a lot of the USAR teams here uh, are using those. We will have um, Infinity will be here this afternoon and talk some more about the GPS. Uh, we'll talk about GPS microphones that go on radios, and they have one that fits their radio, but they are also cable to fit many other radios. And I'll have to say, there's some nice, there's some nice GPS mics that have come out uh, with the Infinity has the advantage of it's a GPS that has a mic, not a mic that they threw a GPS in. It that has a screen on it. So you can use GPS functions off of that. So we'll talk about that. But there again, it's the family radio, um, inexpensive, something to look at. There's basically 14 channels, they're splitter, they're low power, two watt. So the range is limited. The newer versions and the newer software, you can run GMRS repeaters with them. So that's that was a big plus. There's an advantage when we do that with our our units. Uh, this information should be in your manuals. Uh, I'll just skim over it. This is just something that we use as a band plan, and it's uh, probably doesn't apply to a lot of a lot of you. How many people have heard of the uh, FRS emergency um, program? I forget the name. There's two or three of them out there. And basically what it's promoting is if you have a community, your CERT teams uh, have FRS, and if a fan, if you have somebody that is, uh, well, like an ice storm or hurricane, earthquake, that type of situation. The theory is, is it's an inexpensive cell phones ain't going to work, right? You can call your neighbor. And if, a, and if a search team is coming in or public safety is coming in there, again, you need to have that family ready. And it's, it's gaining some popularity. Um, it allows neighbor to neighbor to help each other. And it allows public safety when they're coming in to be able to talk to people within that community. There again, it's very short range, but it's it's very effective. Citizen fan. It's not dead. It's still out there. A lot of truckers there again. 
it's still a good thing to have in your command vehicles and your command post. National SAR frequency um, is designated by the, uh, the National SAR plan. 155.16 is the National SAR mutual aid. It is not an FCC designated, unfortunately. Never has been. Probably never will be. Um, but it is recognized through the National SAR plan. It's recognized by NASAR, which is the National Association of Search and Rescue. And most, most search and rescue teams have it, if they don't use it routinely, they have it at least as mutual aid with other teams. And PA, we're licensed for that statewide. We use that statewide with repeater input, low power. Uh, with temporary base authorization, we use that pretty routinely. Uh, we're lucky because two of the big, nasty school districts that ran in Pennsylvania switched off to other UHF trunk stuff. So that kind of opened it up for us a little bit, made it more usable. We had a, we had a lot of problems. They had you know, base stations at high points, and it was just it was totally trash. Uh, it is shared by a multitude of users, so that kind of limits its use. And some of the inputs and outputs that we we commonly use in SOAR, that's all in the manual, so I'm not going to do use some of the uh, Interoperability, you know, again, strictly as interoperability stuff that we're doing disaster work. I promote, uh, we use a new uh, tech three. We use that pretty heavily down in uh, Louisiana, Hancock County. Show you some pictures of how that was set up. I have to say, it really did outperform two 800 Motorola trunk site with a little 20 watt UHF. So sometimes, keep it simple, stupid is really, you know, does work better. Of course, it wouldn't handle the amount of traffic that they had on their trunk system, you know, with one channel. What's the problem with 625? Anybody got a problem with 625 on the digital? No two companies came up with the same technology yet to make it work. How does it sound? How's it sound? Crappy. We'll find out in a second. But that's the comment. I mean, that's what you, you know, I saw what I hear is it sounds lousy, right? You heard those comments? We have anybody running digital? 625? Any problems? Not 625. I'm sorry? I'm not running digital 625. No. How about anybody running just digital? Either, how's that? What, what kind of system and Smart zone 3.0. Yeah. <coughs> Working good? Yes. How about first days? You had problems in the beginning, you resolved them? I was near the beginning. Yeah. A lot of what you hear about the audio problems, and there's a bit of a myth going around that the uh, digital just ain't going to make it, it ain't reliable, you can't understand. Uh, there was a lot of problems, especially in the very early technology. And Motorola, for the most part, I think, probably uh, was that was in that forefront, so it was a lot of their systems. Uh, the vocoders who were out there were uh, not as advanced as they are today. There's been a lot of development. Yes? I think we were wondering more about was the range. Most of them were so low power. Like the, lot of stuff. the range? Yeah. It's, uh, everybody, the, I mean, one of the issues with the, with the range is been in doing this for a while, everybody will give you that, well, I can hear it, it gets scratchy, but I can still understand what they're saying. All right. Well, the thing with digital is it gets to a certain threshold and it cuts off. And that's what some of the adversaries to digital, and we can try and do, it's kind of hard to do that range thing. I've, I've tried it a couple of times. We can take antennas off and cut it down. But I'll tell you, and, and there's some excuse me, statistical information out there that, that shows that digital will realistically talk farther than what you're going to get in your analog. At least, in, I'm, we're going to show you icon. Right. These are, uh, this one's set up for the uh, 
Well, let me do it this way. Let's try. You guys see if you can tell me which channel is going to be the digital. And which one's narrow and which one's wide. Which one was narrow, which one was digital, and which one was wide? First was wide. First was wide? First wide, last one was digital. Close. Not right. Anybody else? Second one was analog. Second was digital, narrow. Narrow or digital? Narrow. Narrow? Nobody picked the digital. One, just make sure. One was one. The first one was narrow. Second was digital. Nobody picked it. All right. And third was wide. Okay. Which one was 625? The digital. Six, number two. All right. Now, if you listen to me, I, you can notice I was turning away from it because I didn't want you hearing my voice and the radio, because there is a delay, it is digital, so there is a processing time involved. Virtually to that point, I mean, when it drops off, I have to give Motor or uh, ICOM the credit and Kenwood. It's a joint joint venture there. You got Kenwood and ICOM trying to come up with a, a standard so you're not proprietary because that's always been our biggest that's always been our biggest problem is getting that interoperability issue. Now the problem we come into already with the 6.25 is it's not meeting our compatibility with the uh, P25. They're using the uh, NXDN as the standard, what they call NXDN, is the ICOM and Penwins. So it's it's something where you know, you get in there and I can't get it. Hello. Hello. You're getting all of that primary audio that we need. You're getting all of that primary audio that we need. Biggest complaint I heard, especially from a lot of the guys in law enforcement in the original days, was I can't understand. I don't know which officer that is by voice. Did you have that in the beginning? Do you still have that? Not as much delay is what kills us. We're trunking, so we have a lot of delay from the trunking system as well as digital. Yeah. But the voice is recognizable. Yeah. There was that in the early systems. There was a, a little bit of a complaint because it, what they were doing is they're clipping, and they're doing that here too. But the processing has just been refined that much more that they're they're bringing through enough of the audio band that you can still get the inflections. It was like, you know, you can tell when an officer's stressing. Correct. You know, and we'll hear that in some audio, uh, from, you know, from mile 11. And you can tell who the person talking is for the most part. You, you get to know everybody's voices. So you don't even need for them to ID. You know who that person is. Well, in the original days, you had problems with that with the digital. A lot of that's been resolved, I think, pretty well across the board, whether it's Motorola or iPhone or you know, any of the manufacturers. Uh, 
it's it's uh, the P25 issues are are still there. Um, you know, as as they improve the technology, I think we're going to resolve that. We we need we need to do it. We need to do it pretty quick. But as far as the dropping off goes, uh, we've done the testing out there, and it's hard to simulate it here. And really, have not. I think we talk farther than the digital person, <coughs> where you can understand it. I mean, yeah, you'll you might have some swells breaking, but you're not going to understand it reliably. The digital is going to run you up to that point where you're going to be able to understand it far and what you're going to do with the end. Excuse me. Yeah. Can you review the, <coughs> the benefits of going to digital? When you have working radios already. Benefits. Well. Why would you do it now? Why do it now? In the early adopter, as an early adopter, why not wait? Why not wait until five years from now? Whenever. When I look at Maryland that has two point three billion dollars worth of radios. Yeah. Why would I go digital? Probably wouldn't because you wouldn't have the budget to. Right. Right. So what's the benefit to digital? Well, the benefit to digital is that's where the FCC is ultimately going to push it. How soon? You know, that's up in the air. That hasn't been defined. They made the statement that. They're suggesting everybody, if you're going to go a new system, go 625 now instead of 12.5. If you're already sitting on a system, obviously, if you don't have the money, you may not go digital. The big advantage to digital is if you are licensed, I mean, the whole purpose of, of going digital and going narrow is to get more spectrum. So with the digital and the 6.25, You've got, if you've got that one channel now, you've got four channels. Theoretical capability. It depends on how it works out. Wait, wait, wait. No, you don't. You don't. I, I know. I, it's, yeah, you don't. You FCC don't. That's what, does. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. The FCC does. But you have the potential to license for it. Okay. And now I'm getting into that. There you go. That's not one of my, you know. You really don't want to be. Uh, Jason Channel, no. 625 to the monthly split. Uh, no, you want to be away from that. So. Yeah. There, I mean, there's issues as far as you, if you're going to put four digital, and they've done testing with four digital. We've, we've tried you know, running multiple digitals together, and it's amazing the lack of interference. It, it really doesn't handle it very well, which is surprising to me as well. Um, but the theoretical is, is that from one, we've got four. How the four get used, that's that's a licensing and coordination issue. Yeah. I know type one encryption is not available for 12.5. Yeah. What's the bell of the 625? An encryption? Yes, is it AES, DES, is any all available? I don't think anybody's really finalized anything as far as AES goes. I mean it, you're running dig, I mean the fact that you're running the digital is giving you some, but that's there and it's not high. If anybody has a radio, compatible radio could, could listen to it. Um, there, there is some stuff in there, and I'd, I'd recommend, as far as the ICOM goes, you know, stop by the ICOM booth and check with them. I, they're saying that they, they will have, they have a repeater out now. There is a uh, 6.25, and they're, they're introducing that here. Um, and they are saying that they will have an LTR like trunking capability. Um, I think probably this year you'll see that in the ICOM Kenwood. I think Kenwood's already actually off, uh, offered theirs out, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think ICOM's put theirs out yet. Right? I believe Kenwood is offering a trunking version of theirs now. Field programmable. Um, Finn will be here. Uh, you can address those issues with him, but that's a field programmable from the keypad radio. That's like it's up um, How many people carry programming capability in their command post? It's real important to be able to do that. I mean, it's, it's probably one of the quickest ways to interoperability is to be able to add somebody's channel to one of your radios. The simplest form. Uh, the Infinity is, is, is a nice radio. It's got the capability where you can uh, 
do basic programming on the keypad in uh, either VHF or UHF. P25, we're, <laughs> I'm still confused about P25, and I've been following it for long, probably a lot of you. Uh, I, I don't know. Am I wrong to say it's already a dead course? I, I don't know. I mean, it's, we're trying to come up with a standard, and, you know, it's, it's kind of fallen behind, I think, already as far as technology goes. Yeah? So, so what you just did wasn't P25? No. Now P25 would be 12.5 digit. I went. I'm six point. I just went 6.25 digit. Okay. Yeah. So, and you know, listening to the P25, you know, number of the P25 digital radios out there, I, I think we're already surpassing the quality of most of what I've seen in P25. You know, and that's not to say that the P25 isn't. What's out there isn't usable, it is. It's getting used every day. There's a lot of systems going in, and there'll probably be a lot more going in. Um, I don't know. It, it's, it's a hard, hard battle. And I'm glad I'm not in a lot of your shoes because it's a bigger issue for you than it will be for me. Ability to put uh, your radios on local repeaters, and again, I'm talking about if you're moving, you have to understand a lot of what we talk about in the context courses and it's because it's designed as a disaster and a major incident. We're always looking at when we're going from our point A, our home base, to point B. Um, a lot of this applies if you're going to be the one calling for help, but most of what we talk about is class to be if you're going from your point to help somebody. Just keep that in mind in the context of how some of these slides are worded and that, and just look at them most of from that perspective. But when we went down uh, down in Hancock County, we, uh, we put our repeater up, and the guys from uh, Tennessee were there. Anybody from Tennessee? Task Force One? Uh, the guys from Tennessee were there, and man, they were right on it. They had their program and everything else. They programmed our repeater into their UHF radios, you know, and uh, doubled our capability. As a matter of fact, our rib was down, so it's an our boat roll stuff. So rib wasn't working, and they, you know, programmed some stuff into ours that we need. So that's an important capability, you know, and how many got a uh, computer with an RS-232 on it still? <laughs> Don't get rid of them, right? <laughs> I'm always looking for them. Well, here's some of the icon stuff. problem with a lot of the older radios, which are still out there and we're using them every day, right, is the software is primarily, a lot of it was DOS. And even the newer stuff was still RS-232. How many of you, do you see this? That's from RS-232 to USB uh, interfacing and finding that port. <laughs> it's a thing. But, you know, that's their new cables are USB. It's all built in. It does a conversion for you in that little box there. Plug it in your mobile, your port. And uh, you just got to find, uh, I can get my hands on the guy that set up the USB setup. You got to go looking to find out what port you're on and get that set. It doesn't want to tell you automatically. At least not automatically. You know, so having that software. Having that capability with the, uh, um, you know, your laptop in the field is it's pretty critical because you're gonna if you're going somewhere it, it's a lot easier if they're saying you know we've got this repeater capability and we want you to put that in there. So what's the fastest interoperable? Simple, you know, radio here and a radio here. And somebody can be able to talk to the two agencies, right? Did it for years. <coughs> Still works. Everybody seen the Harris announcement? There's a couple, I think there's a couple other ones now that got coming out. And Harris just sent this out. Unfortunately, we're not able to get one for today, but they'll have them out here on the floor, I'm sure. Um, 
the show. That's dual band. Actually, it's wide band. I don't even call it dual band. Uh, 30 to 512. They have a wide band antenna, of course, which won't have peak performance. And then they have a number of other antennas that you can switch if you want to be more band specific and be more efficient. Um, optional internal GPS. So we're coming about to that. Everybody, anybody know about the Xcd Yasu? That's a VX seven uh, R. It's an amateur. Okay. And I've said for the past two years, and I'll say it for the third year. If we can do that for a couple hundred bucks. And realistically, you know, it meets FCC specification. It really can meet it as far as performance. Um, and it gets, you could do if you do, if you are authorized, they will make a statement because you cannot use amateur radios on commercial frequencies. Okay, even though you can make this thing do that if you modify one, but. You can go pretty wide on this. It is dual band. It'll do aircraft. It'll do the AM for the aircraft. It'll do your marine. You know, I mean, you, and it's keyboard programmable and all that stuff. So the capabilities have been around for years. It's it's what money. You know, it's what the manufacturers uh, have to, and, and they have to do it to a degree. But if you can generate that product and sell it three hundred bucks or whatever they are, three fifty, I think four hundred max, anyway, buy it. If they can do it here, why can't they do it? And a simpler problem with doing this, even with amateurs, that's a complicated, right? A lot of people, it's too many buttons, too many options. So it's not something you can even handle. But the capability of doing those frequencies are here or in that. You know, we've had that capability for years. I mean, that's interoperability. I mean, it gives you the capability of talking to your VHF, your UHF, and, it, it, and why then you, know, you can get into the government or anything else. The problem is how to control the abuse. You know, it's always been an issue. Any questions? On, we talked a little bit about radios there. Um, I'm more interested in what the radios can do for you in a, in a disaster situation. Uh, any comments? Yeah. Do you have any experience or opinion about over-the-air reprogramming? Over-the-air reprogramming? Um, in, I mean, in a city situation, where, where are you? I'm, I'm sorry, in Kansas. Kennedy Space Center. Center? We're okay. like a city. Yeah, yeah, basically. Yeah. Um, a number, of the, a number of the radios can do it. I mean, I think one of the things that I see that's not used is kill stuns, in particular, are not programmed into radios. And a lot of them have had them and had them for a while. Um, being able to shut down a stolen radio or a lost radio is probably one of the things that everybody should really look at using, because if that cop or EMS drops that radio and somebody gets it, it's not a, it's not just a security issue. I mean, that's a whole big issue in itself. But it's a kid chunk chunk chunk, you know that stuff. So being able to kill your radio if you have the capability, please look at using that. It, it the techs don't want to do it. And I, I mean, I've been in that boat. It takes some work to set that up and maintain it and program it, you know, because you can't you can't mass program a bunch of radios. Every radio is getting its own program. But once you set that up and get all those programs for every radio in the computer, you know, maintaining it's pretty it's a lot easier. Um, as far as reprogramming radios, there's a couple of them out there that allow you to do it. Um, that's one of the things with P25 and the ICOM capability has it, where you know we can uh, in the P25 you can transfer <coughs> groups and fleets. All right, and um, you know that's a big advantage. There again, that's a lot of pre plan that it takes pre-planned to do that. You're not going to have an, an agency come in probably that uh, you haven't dealt with and be able to take it to that extent uh, if there hasn't been some level of pre-planning done with the agency. But it, 
on a major you know, county level or state level, especially P25, it's a good capability. There again, I don't, I don't get the advantage of dealing with that a lot because most of our funding just goes into that level. Just to help with this question, uh, we do have people to over there programming. For myself, I find it easier to, to have it over the air programming. I have to ensure the battery is charged, the radio is on, and the user is not going to be using it for a period of time. Yeah. I find it just easier to take the laptop to the radio. If the guy is on duty or whatever, I can give him a spare, keep him functioning for the few minutes it takes to program the radio. Right. What he's saying is, is uh, generally it, it turns out to be easier just to get the radio program with the laptop, give him an extra radio if you have to, because it's to do the on air, it's, you know, it's got to be on, battery's good, it's not being used, it's in a good reception area, you know. Um, so it's, that's going to depend a lot on uh, the system. What, what do you use? We have a Maycom trunk. Maycom trunk. Yeah. Is it open? Oh, this way? No. The uh, you know so those are capabilities that are. It's a good tool, but logistically it's pretty hard to ensure that the radio is going to be yeah in the condition needed when you're doing it. If you're doing like a large reprogram of a fleet and you know you can set aside that set of vehicles, then it is a good tool to use for that. Right. Usually just tracking down. I I run. A, I worked for a fire department. The guys are on duty. You don't know when they're going to go on a call. You don't know. Yeah. And the people that are off duty, you, can you arrange to have them have their radios on, fully charged? You have to make as you have to take as much time to arrange the over air programming as getting a hands on yeah. programming. Okay. Okay. Batteries, um, I'll skim over batteries a little bit. It's, it's probably one of the biggest plagues in portables is, is the batteries. Right? Uh, I can think of many, many times I had a wilderness search. I had uh, eight kids in the Appalachian Trail in Pennsylvania, been missing uh, about 18 hours at that point. Very, it was nice during the day, but so below freezing at night. <coughs> we were improperly dressed. And uh, we man tracked them about 12 miles, found them. One girl had gotten wet and was uh, severely hypothermic and conscious. Uh, the dog named Battery went dead with one radio, the other radio uh, couldn't reach. Uh, we were out of our area over the other side of the range, couldn't reach anybody on that. Um, the saving grace was it was a Bendix King. For those of you using Bendix King, it is theoretically not a field programmable radio, right? Because you have to have a little programming button goes on the side. Well, anybody uses Bendix King, especially Wildland guys, you know, you take your knife blade and short out the two pins in the back and you can get it to go into programming mode without that little button. So, luckily, I remember close enough to what the frequency of the adjoining county was when I got out of the and I talked to them and gave them the basic location and then the battery went down because I've been out about 12 hours and uh, didn't have a spare. It only ever happens once. Right? After that, you always have, I've been lugging extra batteries around, never needed them for years now. <laughs> but the programming capability saved, saved the girl. Saved the girl. She, you know, we would have lost her if I had not, we, we came close to losing her. Still took us about six hours to get her out of the woods. The time we could get that into it was get her away. So battery, I mean battery technology has changed a lot. Um, I think the biggest thing I'll say on battery technology is how many people are using analyzers? Good investment, right guys? You get an analyzer, get a conditioner, usually they're combined. Um, you know, it's, I know it's a lot of work, but if you're running caches of radios in particular, you've got to maintain those caches. You just have to do it if you're running rechargeables. You can use some clamshells and double A's, you know, then you've got to just rotate your stock. All right, but a conditioner analyzer is the way to go. It'll save you a, save you a lot of headaches. Um, one of the 
benefit from kids. Alkaline battery packs, land shells. How many people use land shells on the radio? Anybody? That one? Okay. There again, for wilderness, disaster, you know, it's, it's just a standard issue item. If you're, if you're sending a 50, 60 person team, then how do you charge all those radios if you're going into a disaster? And we had that issue. When we went into New Orleans, we got in Wednesday after, uh, two days after uh, New Orleans, we were in on Wednesday morning. And uh, you know, where do you find the power? How do you charge the radios? Uh, we, we burned radios up within about four or five hours because we were talking that much on them. And we couldn't, we didn't have power set up. We didn't even have time to get the generator set up. We, we, we drove in and within probably 10 minutes of hitting New Orleans coming over the bridge, the Sheriff's Department says, yeah, over there, take care of it, handle the volunteers. And we did that. We did it for four and a half, five days. But we burned up our radios. We went to our clamshells. And the clamshells, I mean, alkalines, you know, bunny power, right? Uh, you know, those things will outperform your night as you listen when I was, you know, just plain and simple. It'll give you a lot longer run time. You, know, you have to watch because some of the radios will drop in power. So that depends on the make the radio. Um, but have those backups. And then how are we going to charge those batteries? These are great. We had, you know, these things. Uh, we've used them a number of times. You can buy them. Know, Walmarts and everywhere batteries are sold for your cell phones. Because how do you recharge your cell phones? Don't have that receptacle to plug into. And what's your backup if your radio is working? A lot of times it's the cell phones. If the cell phones work. But these are some of the things you can think about, especially in your disaster cache, if you're responding to those types of things. Vehicle batteries. And that's our saving grace, and that's how once we got settled in, you know, we got our radios on charge. We just cheap inverters. Uh, everybody's saying, you know, you can get the little inverters at uh, Walmart, most of the store. Plugs into your cigarette lighter, gives you 200 watts, 150 watts, 300 watts, or you can go up to the bigger ones. Uh, if you're running something on a command post, our truck, we have a, we have a. Dual battery. I'm sure most of your system, most of your command posts are probably dual or more, more, more than dual battery. Um, but if you're setting up like a chief's truck or command truck, you know, if you're not running dual battery, look at that. As, if, it, if that vehicle is going to function as a communications vehicle as well, if you're going to be doing cross panning, um, you know, or interconnectability and that type of stuff, you know, make sure you've got a big enough alternator vehicle make sure you're running dual batteries and you can get the uh, UPS or the uh, inverter of uh, the UPS charger trip light UPS 2424 uh, why well, I've just been using the heck out of those the past year military uh, it's nice in the military because they already get the 24 and a lot of your civilian vehicles you have to use a separate battery system to run it but it charges it, so when you're on AC, you're charging those that 24 volt bank, whether it's two batteries or six or however many you put into your bank, and it'll handle a pretty good sized bank. It'll give you a good steady 2400 watts plus a good surge. It's not a little unit, it's bolted in. Um, but it's nice, the big thing about it is it's, it is a backup, and it is UPS, so you're running continuous, you don't drop when you lose your AC. We have abused the heck out of these things, and you know we 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 have uh, two of them cached in uh, Pelican that we can take with us. That's how much I like. You know we can take it because we can always find batteries, and then when, when we get our AC, we can run the AC into it. It takes about 30 amps if you've got a good sized bank and it's low, but you can't control that. Even if you've got a limited AC coming in, you can step down the charge rates on it, which is nice. And that's just dip switch program. But it, for running electronics, it's really stable. It's a nice sign wave on it. And uh, they're about six, seven hundred dollar range. Not cheap, but 
that is well worth the money. I mean, people have solar power, portable solar power. Anyway, do we have any USAR teams? I didn't see any that looked like on the list. No USAR uh, You know, there again, you can buy solar panels. This is, uh, I think these are Sundance, Sundance Solar. You can find them on the web. They got panels for everything. I mean, you can get panels to charge your cell phones. Little teeny one like this, really slick with the unit, you know. And you can set that up on the top of your, you know, uh, tent, you know, or outside of the, you know, if you're sitting somewhere in the woods, or whatever, you know, at home. If you lose power, you can charge your cell phone up. Uh, they make the bottom one. Trying to remember this tent, I think, is about 10,000 watts. So you're talking about pretty good, you know, pretty good uh, charge capability off the tent. And one on the far side, this guy over here, that just rolls right up, and you can get different types. It's got a center lighter and that, right? so you can use it to charge uh, the vehicle battery. And, Get the vehicle sitting there, don't want to run the vehicle, you can plug it in. You know, so look at some solar power, especially if you're sending up portable stuff, you're dealing with portable reviews. Power ratings, you know, look at your power ratings, look at the, you know, what kind of equipment you're going to need as far as one of the biggest problems you have is like logistics. Okay. That can become one of the hottest commodities. You know, if you've got 50 radios to charge, right? And you, even if you've got a bank, you know, you still need a bunch of plugs. And when you don't have a bunch of plugs, it's real embarrassing when you got to go back and tell your boss why you had to cut all the plugs off the chargers because you water wire them all together to feed them. You know? So, simple things. If you're going to be responding, you know, either to remote wilderness or disaster or any kind of temporary environment, you know, make sure you've got that way to get the power to the owner. It's the little things that hurt you in the end. How much extension cord do you have and what kind of cable? And make sure that you have some adapters. We carry a bunch of, oh, oh we got L20, L2014, L20s, L14s, L5s, you know, all the different plugs that go in all the different generators. Because yeah, every generator has 110 volt plugs on them. How much current do you get out of that one plug in the generator? 15 amps. And the 30 amp or the 50 amp sitting next to it sits there doing nothing, and all you're getting off of that 6,000 watt generator is 15 amps. Because you don't have the plug to get into the 220 or the 30 amp 110. So think about that there again in making up your cash kit, you know, especially from the tech guy side. All right, command post stop. I think we're ready for break, right? Why don't we take a little short five minutes? Seven? Let's shoot for seven. Seven hands. Limited phones, unfortunately. I'm, I would hope that they would push this. They should be pushing with what's going on with Sprint. I don't understand the philosophy, and I'm hoping I can find somebody here at the conference and peg it to the wall. Uh, Blackberry is what I got here is the curve. Uh, I got a Pearl Motorola is what she has. Uh, there is a uh, Nokia out. I'll get the Nokia. Not, I mean, Nokia's aren't too bad, but the Nokia would push and talk. The audio is loud. Uh, LG, I have not tried. All three of these sound great. The Motorola, um, to me, is, I don't know, I just like the audio. This audio is nice, it's clear. Um, I'm not a big Blackbird fan, I don't know. but I uh, wish they would expand it out. But it works good. And uh, the, the reason we looked at it is we never really ever did get Nextel to give us good group function for our team. When we went to Nextel, they sold, oh yeah, you'll be able to talk to everybody. Because we cover 14 counties, so we don't have a radio system that talks everywhere we want to talk. So we thought Nextel would be the way to go. 
we never got next album done the way we wanted it to. There, in the beginning days, you didn't have national, and then now you still have to pay extra for national. It's included in here. One of the big things I've been trying to find, because what, you know, if we got this, what's the next great thing that we can add to this? Because it's IP based, bring it onto a laptop or a desktop computer, right? Can't offer, I mean, and, they, and they, everybody, they promote it in some of the literature that they can do that. Nobody's got a clue on how to do it. Have you, are you doing that? Have you come up with anything? Um, I'm not part of that team, but I don't know how far they put the data on it. All right, if you could get my card, if, if you could, I really would like some help on it, if anybody else does that. Because that would be the next best thing, because that's always been one of the problems we've had in the like next step, is how we get into our concept, right? So you had to do these things, we'd take the phones and interface the phone to a console. And, well, if we could do it on a computer, it'd be really simple. Same thing for disaster. Yeah, like voice instant messaging? Yeah, you can do voice instant messaging. They have that function. You can do, you can do instant video. I have done it. It's like a video thing you can do with it, too. What's the stuff is a GSM? Uh, it's available on basically, well, it's GSM on, on AT&T. You can get, it's available on other formats. It's, I mean, push the talk over POC, push the talk over cellular. It's, it's all similar and it's, uh, it's the most, they're all basically still based. The AT&T showed more features available than CDP. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it, you know, we, it does not seem, that what I've tried on like, uh, I did see a sprint version, and it was, it was a little bit slower, I thought. You know? um, the, the, the big thing is, in theory, the interoperability on this is we should be able to talk between systems for this. It's, it's IP based. So it's a matter of everybody getting together in the same room again to come out with a standard which they don't have.